Welcome to Bounce Boxing Theory, number one film study artist on the planet, number one striking coach on the planet. Teach anybody how to punch hard, anybody guaranteed 100% how it all works. Welcome to Bounce Boxing Theory. In this video, we're going to be talking about was it really the blood? You know, we got a little bit of film to go over, and we're also going to be talking about a little bit of the Raleigh Romero fight as well. <clears throat> Actually, let's go ahead and talk about that first. Uh, do you guys uh, remember that clip? of him taking a point, the referee. <clears throat> Raleigh Romero was doing this, and this is the reason why the referee took a point. It wasn't so much the holding, but it was kind of how he would get to the holding. He would kind of grab um, <clears throat> uh, Cruz's head, and he would kind of pull him down, and I think the referee kind of missed this part. But this was the really egregious part, the reason why uh, Raleigh actually did deserve to maybe lose a point. You know, and it's really interesting to kind of think about... Um, you know, should the referee be getting involved? Should he be saying this or that? Could you guys imagine if we watched 12 rounds of Raleigh Romero going 2-3-2-3, two, three, two, three, grab, 2-3-2-3, two, three, two, three, grab, and then at the end of the fight he says boxing is easy? Can you guys imagine how awful of a fight? And just stopping him from being able to hold the guy's head down, now he actually had to fight. It wound up being a good fight, and the better fighter won. Not the guy who could grab and, you know, just was a good athlete, could throw punches fast and hard enough that you had to interact with him no matter what. Um, and then hold, <clears throat> you know, so excellent, excellent job from the referee. Again, this is what was needed in the Cambosis fight with uh, Haney, right? Again, Haney has developed a lot, but the holding and stuff, you know, getting that eliminated from the sport, um, the needless, the fake holding the stuff that stops the good fighters from actually winning fights, <coughs> excuse me, I mean, is Isaac Cruz a guy who's going to be complaining about being held and being cheated? No, he's a humble guy. He's going to take it. He's going to expect the referee to do his job. And unfortunately, there are people like Romero, Haney, that are like, well, any advantage that they're not going to take, I'll take. I'll take it no matter what. You know, no big deal. <clears throat> so here we go we're going to start the uh zoo film study so first off we're going to talk about the cut okay pushes him off his line with the hook now if we take a look at their feet here fendora has kind of lead foot dominance throws the shot zoo kind of pulls it tries to jump in with the hook and his leg kind of gets tangled here and now his head kind of ducks like this now another reason why again you should keep your head up Right now, this is not necessarily Tinzu's fault. Like I thought it was when he was watching. I didn't realize his foot got tripped. I thought he just ducked his head and kind of smacks it into Fendora's elbow here. And Fendora's expecting the head to come. So he sees the head coming. And what? He thinks it's going to be a punch. So he's blocking the body. Elbow <clears throat> winds up cutting Tinzu's head. Now, is Fendora going to get robbed of the glory of this performance? Well, I'm going to do my best to show that it no, but, you know, a little bit of it is unavoidable. So controlling him, lead hand control. And a lot of Tim Zhu's offense took a lot of energy. Okay, and we're going to be taking a look, a lot, a lot of clips in the first round and the second round, kind of talking about him, explaining them, but shoots this two, pull off of a pull counter, and then has to continue shifting forward. He has to make three moves to counter the jab, right? Every single time Fandora throws a jab like this, right? Every single time Roland Fahim throws a shot, he has to go down, snap super fast, snap up super fast, and then snap down super fast and shift and put himself in danger. He has to do that every single time Fandora throws a jab. No, obviously not. But what happens when he doesn't, when he doesn't attack that? Now, <clears throat> this is a pretty long clip here. <clears throat> Starts off with Tim Zhu exploding into a right hand to the body. Now, I do want to point out, there was not that many body shots for someone who calls himself the body snatcher, fighting literally the guy named the Towering Inferno. What are you supposed to hit tall guys with? You don't get much taller guys than this. Exploding into a two. Okay. Now, again, he has to jump and pendulum into these moves, coming forward, <clears throat> lead hand control. And what happens when he can't, right? Tim Zhu is not a guy who is slipping and crossing the line a lot. He's kind of a position to fighter, fights on the right side of the line, right? Uses a lot of energy here, not getting a lot of value. How come he didn't pull counter and shift and throw a right hand? Well, it takes a lot of energy. 
Okay, and every single time Fedora gets to the line and he has to interact with the feint here. Oh, damn it, he didn't get the right look. Look at he did a stepping jab right there. Nothing for Fedora. And this was a lot of the fight in the first round and the second round where Fedora, granted, wasn't getting his nose broken. Okay, and we're going to talk about those clips as well, but look at how little effort it is for Fedora to attack the line. And look at how much effort it was for Tim Zhu, for Tim Zhu to find a way to get on the line with, uh, with Fedora. Now, finding an opportunity again, throwing this shot, not getting any value, now having to work his way back in off the jab. And again, so much of the fight was fought at this range. While the blood did play a part in the fight, we're going to talk about what part I think it played. But again, very, very difficult for him to bridge the gap. And then again, right back into the jab from Vendora. Right back into the lead hand control, pushing him off his line. Again, shooting this shot. Big step, right hand. What do you notice about all the attacks that Tim Zhu's kind of landing? They're all right hands, right? Now, nothing wrong with that. But every time your opponent throws the shot, shifts forward, has to rip back. Again, I don't want to say he falls off balance, but not very good protection for his right hand here. Not very many jabs. So many of his attacks are right hands. How many times when you guys go to the gym do you just stand in front of the heavy bag bashing your right hand into the bag over and over and over again? It's a lot of energy, right? When is he throwing his easy punches, right? Again, a lot of energy, a lot of energy. Now, he does wind up timing and fighting and punching with Fendora. And I thought this was really interesting because Fendora kind of went first with his shot. And then Tim Zhu slipped it. He lands a great shot here. Pretty good. He lands kind of on the shoulder a little bit here. And then Fendora gets kind of pressured here, gets controlled, moves off his line. Caught right here. One of the best shots he lands in the first round. Good job. He finally bridges the gap. Even Fendora kind of nods at him, gives him a little bit of, okay, good job. But there really wasn't that much going on. Okay, now again, another one of these longer clips where we've got Tim Zhu coming forward, okay, getting picked off on the outside, stepping jab, getting picked off here, right? High, high energy move to be chasing the jab back, gets no value, okay? Gets pushed off his line by a right hand, no, or a rear hand, a left hand from Fedora. Did he have to pay for it? Did Was it a lot of energy from Fedora? Fedora is kind of cruising right now. And Tim Zhu has to be putting on a lot of pressure. Control, right? A lot of jabs. He picked it off and then got hit by the second one. Okay? Trying to come forward. And again, all this time here, 30 seconds here, that Tim Zhu is on the outside. Getting to the line. Getting pushed off. Not getting any value. This is exactly what the fight looked like, right? We've got Tim Zhu giving little feints, don't go in low. But this is mostly what the fight looked like when Tim Zhu was covered in blood. Tim Zhu goes first, throws the shot, gets picked off a little bit, picked off with the cross here, no value. Again, not a lot of value there. <clears throat> hit with a two, almost hit with the cross, tries to put pressure on Fendora. Chasing back the jab a little bit here. And again, look at him out of position here. Getting hit here. Not a lot of great work. Not a lot of opportunity there for Tim Zhu to find himself in position and in range to hit Fendora unless he's literally always working. Right? The reach advantage was just so great. And like, you know, give Tim Zhu some credit. Like, it's not easy to fight a guy like that, of course, right? We know, okay? We know. But, um... <clears throat> so much of the fight on the outside here. Good shot from Zoo, right? And then right back to the being on the outside, okay? And again, coming forward, chasing that back. A lot of energy, getting picked off. Good shot here. Really good shot from Tim Zhu. Okay, and this is a lot of the work in round two. <clears throat> and then right back on the outside. Right back to all that energy. Look at how he has to defend the jab from Fendora. He can't just let Fendora just keep throwing that shot at him. Kinda, right? Well, that's kinda what happens later in the fight. 
But for over a minute after landing that great shot here, Tim Zhu's going to sit on the outside, trying to beg to find a way on the inside, trying to find a way to get to the inside. Again, not really landing any punches, getting kind of caught with a shot here, trying to cross the line. How often does Tim Zhu make it to that position? Well, throughout the rest of the fight, he makes it there like maybe like five times. He'll come across the line with a leg, a leaping left cross or whatever. But Tim Zhu, again, decent control, right? Not getting hit a lot here. <clears throat> but so much of the stuff that he does to kind of stay uh, close to Fendora takes a lot of energy. Constantly have to interacting with the jab, right? You can't just let your opponent throw it. Leaping three into a two. No value. He chased him around for literally 30 seconds, and that was the first thing that he really threw. No value. How long until he throws something else meaningful? And again, so much of the fight was this. Just Tim Zhu trying to follow Fendora around, trying to chase him, not really able to get close to him. Decent, right? One, two. Kind of gets him. <clears throat> But Tim Zhu struggled, you know, and he struggled, and it's not just because of the blood. It's because Fandora's tall as hell. Picking him off, again, Tim Zhu struggling on the right side of the line, found a way to cross, and he lands a good shot. And this is where he kind of breaks Fandora's nose, catches him with another good shot. And again, it's hard right hand, right? Slipping, trying to smash across the line, really, really, really high energy. Pendulum here, control. Down, up, lands another shot, control, pendulum, down, up, body shot, finally a body shot, all right hands though, all right hands, eats an uppercut, Fendora shows that he's not really hurt, now Tim Zhu's going to catch him with another right hand, and then again, another right hand a really good one boom that might be the one that kind of broke his nose okay <clears throat> but all of these are tim zoo's hardest punch his hardest punch in a row his hardest punch big hook big jumping huge shot these are not like easy shots to throw and i think that tim zoo wound up kind of punching himself out a little bit that's not the right clip um wound up kind of punching himself out a little bit <clears throat> um, trying to get to uh, Fandora's line, um, especially after the cut, because after he lands like those 10 right hands in a row on Fandora, he does break his nose. In the third round, he has this huge gash. He comes out, spends the first minute and a half throwing bombs, huge punches, okay, huge punches, and... Uh, Obviously, he doesn't finish. He doesn't get the, the KO. And then winds up in that place where he's stuck on the right side of the line. He's not really slipping. He's not really um, making it across the line. He's not really able to attack Fendora's position because most of his attacks, they require him to cross the line. He has to cross and throw the rear hand. But we can see how much effort it is. He has to pull counter. He has to throw. And then he has to defend it. It's so much effort. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> while I do think that um, on average, Tim Zhu is a more capable fighter than Fandora, I thought that Fandora won the fight. And, you know, it's not Fandora's fault that Tim Zhu ran his head into his elbow. Fandora's elbow literally could not have been farther away from Tim Zhu's head. It was literally on his own body when Tim Zhu smashed into it. You know, and to be honest, the referees saw that cut. They let the third round go. And then after the third round, when they saw that it was a bloody mess, a bloody mess when he came back to the to the the corner before the fourth round, they should have stopped it. They should have stopped it. They should have gone to the cards <clears throat> or declared it a no contest or <clears throat> you know, maybe they let it go six rounds and they stop it. You know, and, and give Give Tim Zhu at least some chance. No, I don't want to say give him some chance of winning the fight because after four, it has to go to the cards, right? Tim Zhu won the first round. Give him credit for winning the second round. Third round was, you know, they were all still close. And that's the thing is 
it's not like the the blood really inhibited you know, you know kind of did you know a little bit it did it did but tim zoo's a gasser tim zoo's a gasser he's not a guy in his entire 12 rounds against brian mendoza 12 rounds he threw 400 punches the, the numbers are just always really bad for tim zoo and then he's fighting a guy who's literally every moment of the fight that he's not putting pressure on him or he's anywhere, there's a jab in his face. There's a beat, you know? There's so much activity <clears throat> in uh, Tim Zhu. You know, normally if there's a lot of activity, he's pretty good, pretty good puncher. And, you know, probably definitely broke. <laughs> well, actually, Fundora did say at the end of the fight that um, he's a bleeder that they bleed, and uh, maybe that means his sister bleeds too. I don't know. Um, but uh, maybe his nose wasn't broken. But either way, you know, the um, I thought it was a good fight from Fandora. I thought that uh, that um, Tim Zhu, decent puncher, right? Couldn't put him away, couldn't connect the line enough. Um, and couldn't make uh, Fendora pay for his uh, for his activity. You know, there was just so much energy. And again, Tim Zhu doesn't throw that much punches. He's not like he's not like in bad shape, right? But <clears throat> he doesn't really train to throw a lot of punches. I guess I don't know. Whatever it is that he gasses, <laughs> um, you know. But um. um as far as uh, the fight, it was a pretty entertaining fight. You know, it did suck that you did kind of feel like the blood was playing a part. But it's like, here's the thing. Tim Zhu normally fights guys who are going to fight on their back half of their line. Or Tim Zhu fights guys that he's fast enough to hit and push to the back half of their line. So even if they're an aggressive fighter, they start fighting defensively. And Fandora could start the fight so far on the front foot because he has such a huge reach advantage. Tim Zhu had to fight in his defensive side, right? And not be the, you know, <clears throat> I mean, he still was. He just had a harder time crossing the line. And all the time that he spent not crossing the line, he had to pay for, which is not usually the case. You know, Tony Harrison would let him follow him around till they get to the ropes and he would get beat up. <clears throat> You know, it was different because Fendora was beating him up on the way to get to the ropes to get beat up himself. And Fendora was getting hit with hard shots his whole fight, you know. So if you guys want to watch the full film study, by the way, um, we're going to be doing it. Uh, we're going to be watching. Actually, we're going to be watching the Kermel Moton fight. Um, Surprise that one went to the went to the cards. That kid's a beast. Uh, we're going to be watching um, uh, in. Uh, Pitbull Cruz beat the crap out of Roley Romero. Now, I thought he was going to get Roley in the first round. That was nuts. Um, actually, yeah, let's talk about that real quick. And, you know, the rest of the, the video is just going to be, like, boxing news crap. Um, and uh, random stuff. <clears throat> but um, Roley Romero, pretty close to a good performance. You know, without the holding on top of his head, um, some of those middle rounds were pretty good. You know, you know, I think um, <clears throat> someone said that the judge had Roley winning on one of the cards, right? And it's like, Roley, you're a great athlete, <laughs> you know? Uh, you need to find somebody, you need to work with somebody who can teach you what to do with all that athleticism, you know? Um, you know, I, I'm surprised that, that you will, cause I, you know, I think I met, I went to the gym, is it city, is this city boxing in Las Vegas? Um, and Rolly was there and I could hear him going, eh, eh. you know, I was meeting with, um, with the guy doing a private there and, uh, you know, Casamayor was there. It was cool to meet him. I didn't really know, like, I didn't want to be like, oh, like, pfft. I know this is Yoel Casamayor because he's Cuban and he doesn't really speak English and he's at a boxing gym, so it must be Yoel Casamayor because, you know what I mean? But 
pretty sure it was him. It was cool. Um, I don't know why that guy hasn't been able to show him how to move around in boxing. You know, that guy was a great boxer. You know, one of my, you know, one of my favorite fighters of all time. Um, you know, made punching look easy. You know, uh, definitely an example of a two foot puncher, right? Um, but um, Raleigh looked okay in spots. He looked like he might have enough to do it. You know, now as soon as he's lost the ability to really control Cruz and keep Cruz from throwing punches at him on the inside, he started getting beat up because without being able to just grab your opponent and hold or duck below the waist like Floyd Mayweather, right? Duck below the waist and then hold, right? If you're not allowed to do that, where do you go? You have to keep pendulum stepping and running like Shakur Stevenson, which we saw was worst fight of the decade, worst fight ever. <clears throat> Is that fight worse than Nganu versus that one guy <laughs> when they threw like nine punches in the whole fight? Like... Uh, Derek Lewis, right? It was, right? And that's what happens when you, you have those kind of fights where guys don't have to engage, they duck below the waist, or they're just pendulum stepping and running away. You know, those are not like Rigondeau versus um, Casemiro, right? It's not a real fight. Now, if you just penalize the guy who's running, which actually it says in the rules, <clears throat> it says... uh. Um, a guy who refuses to engage should lose a point, right? It's in the rules, the scoring rules. That's what Shakur Stevenson did. Now, Raleigh Romero didn't do that. He would stop running because everyone was booing, and then uh, Isaac Cruz would tee off on him. And then he would try to hold, or he would hit him first. And it was interesting because Raleigh Romero's fucking fast. He's so fast. And he would let those two threes go, pop, pop, you know? And Isaac Cruz would sometimes just let him off. He wouldn't even try to follow up. Or the two would stick him, you know, and, and he would be able to keep, and uh, Isaac Cruz wouldn't be able to follow up and chase him. So I do think that while, uh, you know, I liked, uh, <laughs> I liked, uh, um, Roly Romero's response to the lady at the end, you know, it was kind of weird. You know, the dude literally just got knocked out 20 seconds ago and they give him the the mic, you know, like kind of Joe Rogan was kind of right about that. Don't do that shit to people. Don't do that. That's dumb. You know, he was kind of slow. He was kind of, he didn't figure out what he wanted to say yet. You know, I did like what he said. I thought it was cool. Um, but the lady's like, do you think that you underestimate him? Trying to make him look stupid. And he's like, no, I trained hard. Don't be stupid. Like, don't be a dumb bitch. You know, that's all fucking shit. That's a hype for the fight. Do you think you underestimated him? No, I trained hard. Great answer. Of course. Even these guys expecting easy fights, they go into the gym. <laughs> they train hard, most of them. <clears throat> anyway. Don't give up, Roly. Uh, keep learning, you know. Reach out, Roly. I can help you. <laughs> um, back to the bloody mess that is the newest hot division. In boxing, the 154-pound division. Let's talk a little bit about uh, boxing stuff. I guess, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about is Shakur Stevenson. We touched on it already. He went from fighting the hardest fight in his career, De Los Santos, to trying to get in line to get a fight with Tank Davis. Is that what's going on? Because... He was supposed to be, oh, I'm calling out Devin Haney, I'm calling out Ranger, I'm calling out, I'm making the call-outs, blah, 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 blah. And now he's fighting Frank Martin's leftovers, right? A guy who just got beat by Frank Martin, so he's lining up to maybe get a fight with Tank? Is he looking for more easy fights? <laughs> no. This is an interesting thing, because, well, does Shakur Stevenson deserve title fights just for moving up in weight? You know, obviously, like, you know, and as we move on, we talk more about this idea. Um, you know, how do you want to say this? Shakur Stevenson, I believe he, I think I remember him recently moving up. 
and uh, uh, without having to put yourself through the ranks, you don't have to beat these guys or that guys, right? You know, it puts, I don't want to say like that, all the belts at hostage every time everyone moves up, like Devin Haney moves up to 140, all of a sudden he's fighting the champion, you know? <clears throat> that kind of stuff. Why? Because he was the champion at 135. Lame. <laughs> kind of lame, to be honest. You know, and... um. Um, but having to work your way up is also one of those ways that you get the easy fights. You get to get used to the weight class. You know, Floyd Mayweather got to make it popular, just move up and fight the champion. You know, like he went from, you know, what did he start out as champion? I don't even remember. But how many fights did he have at 140? How many how many fights did he have at 135? You know, maybe quite a few at 135, you know, but he had like three at 140, right? Like some really low number and then moved right to 147. <clears throat> but I think this is a problem in boxing, you know, because, well, let's just go ahead and skip over the Shakur stuff. You know, that guy's, who the fuck is that guy trying to fight? You know, like, <laughs> oh, I'm going to retire. What was that about? So were you going to try to get on steroids, trying to get out of the testing pool, trying to, you know? <laughs> But um, fighting Frank Frank Martin's leftovers. I don't even know the guy's name. Like an easy fight. Zapata. I don't know why Zapata wouldn't fight him. That seems silly, except for the fact that like, if there's no money in that, like, who wants to watch Guillermo Rigondeaux, Olympic gold medal boxer? Who wants to watch that guy fight? Spoiler alert. I do. <laughs> I love watching that guy fight. He was, you know, he was amazing when I was like first learning boxing. I loved watching that guy. You know, I still want to watch him fight. I still want to watch Shakur Stevenson fight, but I want him to learn how to fight too. But uh, getting back to um, whatever the hell is going on in the 154 pound division, right? Terrence Crawford is he or isn't he a 147 pounder? Did he lose his belts and then move up to 154, have no fights lined up, and then now Tim Zhu lost to Pandora? Who is he fighting? But, interestingly enough, right, if Pandora fights Spence, Spence is not ranked. Spence has no titles. Spence is not a champion. Spence lost his last fight. And what, he's he's moving up to fight the 154-pound champion? Well, I heard that if Spence fought Tim Zhu, because that's why he's there, it was not going to be for the titles. Which is interesting, right? Well, I want to say first off, that's great. Good job, Spence. I, I hope that you can make money without having to pay the sanctioning fees. Hell yeah. Fandora, Tim Zhu, both of you guys, that's a great opportunity for you guys too. <clears throat> um... Without having your all your winnings taxed, <laughs> just so you can say that you're a champion, right? Now, getting back to the real world, um, boxing world, right? Um, what the fuck? Why the fuck would Spence be in consideration for this at all? <laughs> he just got his fucking ass beat at 147. He just got obliterated. And now he's already already a rated fighter at 154. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous that Haney was a ranked fighter at 140 without fighting anybody at 140. Right? He barely, he gets, number one, loses to Lomachenko. Somehow gets the belts. Isn't forced in fighting a rematch with Loma, a fight that he lost. Gets to move on and fight Cambosis twice. Why? Am I backwards? Maybe I'm backwards. But why fight Cambosis twice? And Loma once move up. All that aside, all that aside, moving up and being ranked for the champion already, I think it's bad for boxing. I think that you know it, it, it's especially funny now for Crawford with uh, with Crawford. Who's he gonna fight? Is Tim Zoo right? Like. Okay, is Fedora gonna 
abandon his titles to fight Errol Spence? Is he going to give up the titles he just got to fight Errol Spence? And then are we going to get to see Crawford versus Tim Zoo anyway for the belts? Like, what world? And then is are the are the the bodies are they gonna sanction Errol Spence versus Fedora even though he's not ranked? Even though they're also trying to push Crawford as the mandatory, which why is Crawford the mandatory? He has no fights at 154 pounds. He's five eight, right? He's not a big dude, right? Like Tim Zhu. You know, I do want to say, you know, time a little bit. Um, Tony Harrison said uh, Tim Zoo got the easy work on the way up to the title. And it's like, maybe it wasn't easy. I don't think that it was necessarily easy. It was fast. It was short for him. It took a long time for Tony Harrison, you know. But neither one of these guys have fights at 154. There are people that have been in 154 waiting for f titles because Charlo's been holding up the division forever. Forever. You know, and Spence and Crawford just jumped the gun. Like, damn, I know Crawford, he needs to get out of that hot division. 147 and some killers coming up. Virgil Ortiz was the worst of them. But he's at 154 now too, right? Who wants to fight this guy, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and then Jerron Ennis at 147, you know. Crawford is definitely like in between a rock and a hard place, I'll say. You know, the 147 or the 154, um, like in in terms of what he does, like I think he's going to – he would beat Tim Zhu. You know, I think that there was a, a time where Tim Zhu was like – you know, and, and it changes, you know, as people – get better and they fight better competition you know we got to see one of tim Zhu's biggest weaknesses tonight well he ain't got no fucking head movement he didn't really cross the line he he fights from one side of the line now he's fast he got a killer straight right hand he got a killer left hook he's fast but he uses so much energy accomplishing his things you know he's just not very efficient and like maybe nobody's really efficient when you fight someone who's six five right <clears throat> Except Brian Mendoza. <clears throat> anyway. Um, yeah. What does Crawford do now? I mean, how stupid would it be? Tim Zhu just lost. Fair and square. Okay. Um, I think that even with the blood, it was a winnable fight. You know, but uh, the fact that he, he's going to wear down. Tim Zhu just wears down. He gets tired. He's... You know, there's a – in that first clip, you can see after he, he lands a good right hand, he takes a step back. And you, you see him at the beginning of the first round. He takes a huge breath and moves off of Fedora and allows Fedora to throw punches at him. And that was just something that happened in the first round. So Tim Zhu, you know, like what a mess losing this fight was. But also, what a huge mess – Errol Spence being offered a fight against the 154-pound champion, right? And, like, if they sanction it, if they sanction it, it's bad for boxing because Errol Spence just got fucked up. He already got fucked up by the guy who's trying to get those titles, right? And Errol Spence is, you know, I don't, I don't know who he's going to work with. Um... Going forward, I heard him and Derek James split up. Yo, Errol Spence, reach out, bro. I can help you. But um, I don't see, I don't see very many trainers, other than myself, being able to teach Errol Spence how to not get knocked out. And here's the thing: is like there aren't very many. There's, it's probably one of those inevitable things. You know, Errol Spence has a lot of a lot to learn to bridge the gap between him and him and Crawford. 
a lot of looks, a lot of head movement, a lot of, you know, Errol Spence is very, his head's, it's on a platter, you know? And, um, you know, it would take a lot of work, and I don't think that, you know, him winning the titles at 154 would even be a good idea. Because then what? Is he going to do that, uh, who's that guy that wanted to call... You wanted to call Lennox Lewis a garbage picker? No, I don't know. It was that guy. Man, a heavyweight guy. Relinquished his belt and threw it in the trash and refused to fight this guy. <laughs> you know, is that what Spence is going to do? And then just move up to 160? Or try to fight Fedora? And then, and then try to fight Canelo? Is he trying to rattle off a win or two and then avoid Crawford? You know, there's just no world, I think, where where Errol Spence is going to be able to beat Crawford. You know, especially as Crawford moves up. Because here's the thing, you know. And I do want to point this out, by the way. Okay, this is really important. Except for Crawford going from 147 to 154. When he went from 130, um, 135 and 140 to move up to the welterweight division, he worked his way up. Crawford didn't just get, you know, he had to fight a bunch of guys before any of the champions or anybody would really fight him. He worked really hard for that. <clears throat> now, how satisfying was Spence versus Crawford? What happened if, if right after beating Julius and Dango, he moves up to welterweight, knocks Spence out? Same thing happens. 100% would have. Does anybody care? Is it the same big, huge thing? Right? I know. Spence only got so much time in his life or whatever. But anyway, those are just my thoughts about the bloody mess that is uh, the 154-pound division. Um, we're going to be watching those fights. <clears throat> the Carmel Moton fight, the Cruz fight, and the full Fendora Zoo fight on Patreon. It's free to sign up. Uh, for seven days, and then it's ten bucks a month after that. Um, yeah. If you guys got any questions, leave them in the comments below. And we're gonna be doing like uh, maybe like a weekly thing like this where we talk about uh, random boxing bullshit. Okay. Um, and like a little bit of film study, you know. <clears throat> anyway, see you guys.